Hello, cross-culture community, people of faith, viewers from all over the world, partners in the work of kingdom building and family of God. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship time with premieres every Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Most Christians know what Christ saved us from, but most also are ignorant of what Christ saved us for. Today, our pastor Tiffany Quesada Sarkis will dive deep into Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 to explain restoration into the image of God as the purpose of salvation declared by Scripture, a purpose which forces us to evaluate ourselves as to whether we are really in the kingdom or not. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. May God bless you through His Word today. Lord, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Oh, I believe it. Lord, because I hope in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. You have no need of my good things. 
to the saints on his earth, in them he magnified all his will. Their diseases were multiplied, they hastened after these things. I will not join in their assemblies of blood, nor will I remember their names with my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You are he who restores my inheritance to me. Portions fell to me among the best, and my inheritance is the very finest. I will bless the Lord who caused me to understand. Moreover, until night, my reigns also instructed me. I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced exceedingly. My flesh also shall dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to see corruption. You made known to me the ways of life. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. For many of us who've grown up in the church, we memorized verse 8, right? It is by grace we are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God and all that good stuff. For, it, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. See that? It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's the word of the Lord. Now, when I was reading this, I was focusing on a couple of things. We are his workmanship and the good works. So we're going to unpack that this afternoon. So, by grace, this is verse 8 and 9. So, we have heard this sentence so many times in the last, oh, I don't know how many years, that sometimes, even, I mean, as a teacher and preacher, I have to remind myself to be in awe of it. It is such a wonderful gift. I mean, it's so basic, yet so deep. It's so easy to grasp, yet so difficult to accept. This is understandable in its simplicity, yet impossible in its complexity. In other words, it's one of those concepts where people say it can't be that simple. Really? I mean, to enter the kingdom, I don't need to do anything physically or, you know, tangibly. But as we're going to learn later on, and as we have learned in the book of James, it is the works that prove your faith. So continue. So it begins by saying that it is by grace we are saved. So if we're saved by it, then grace must be vitally important to understand. So the word has a variety of meanings. It can mean kindness, favor, a gift, or a blessing. But because it has been shown by God to man, most people define it as either undeserved or unmerited favor. So it is clear to us that we do not deserve it because of passages just like that one. Now, remember this is a repetition of what Paul has said in verse 5. In verses 4 to 5 in chapter 2, he said, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. So if we remember from last week, it's a life exchange. Dying to ourselves 100% so that the promises of God can really be lived out in our lives. Yes, he made us alive, saving us by grace. And yes, it is nothing that we deserve. But we need to remember that the kingdom walk is exactly that. It is a partnership with the living God. It says in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's highlight the word love. So often it is not highlighted in teachings and preachings to me that it was because of his own love, because of his exchange of his own life, 
that we should exchange ours to fully live for the kingdom. So by God's blessing, kindness, and gift, we have this wonderful, beautiful kingdom life. Now here's another word that's been floating around the church, saved. It's another Christian word that we fail to define when we use it. Because most people know that it means to be rescued or delivered from danger, harm, or death. But when a Christian asks, I'm saved, are you saved? Or do you want to be saved? Then what he's actually saying is that you need to be saved from something, right? For example, when you have been saved, we were saved from this perverse generation. I mean, it's getting worse and worse day by day, right? The word perverse is putting it kindly. Like I mentioned before, I was, I was reading an article on CBN.com where a, a class of six-year-olds were asked to pen vows for same-sex unions or a love letter to somebody of the same gender. Six years old. They're babies. So we are saved from this perverse generation. But that requires that life exchange that we talked about. And we were also saved from the wrath of God. This is Romans 5, 9. But there is also that judgment that we need to remember. So with that in mind, we can all understand this verse by saying, for by God's blessing, kindness, gift, favor, and love, which we didn't deserve, we have been saved from this corrupt world from death, from wrath, and from judgment. So it really is a life exchange. I don't know how many people I have led to Christ that thought that praying the prayer was a magic potion or a magic formula. I prayed that prayer so life should be good. Well... I don't know about squeaky clean, keep your nose clean, life is good, but we'll be able to work through all the challenges of life with Christ. Next is the word faith. So faith is simply belief that is acted on, but it is not just any old faith that brings God's love and God's grace. What's that in Hollywood? It's F-A-T-E, faith. Not that, we're not talking about chance here. Here's a good example right here. Some people have enough faith in the engineers at Boeing to get in a plane and trust that they will arrive safely at their destination, correct? Mm -hmm. For those of you who travel for business, for pleasure, long vacations, that is our complete and utter trust that the plane is gonna take us from LAX to wherever we're going. Correct? Mm -hmm. Now, if we could just take that same trust, that same just caution to the wind trust and give it to our Lord, mm -hmm. right? It's tough to do that sometimes. Yeah, Lord, I'll trust you if the solution is the way I want my solution. Lord, I will trust you if you do me this one favor. Right? Now, come on, church. If we can blindly trust in the pilots and engineers of a Boeing plane to get us where we need to go, let us put that same trust in the God who delivered us Amen. and who brought us into his family. Mm -hmm. But the Bible is specific about exactly what faith will save us with. In Acts 20, 21, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 26, 18, Jesus said that the people have been sanctified by faith in me. In Galatians 2, 20, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So saving faith is really faith, kingdom living faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what is politically correct to say, a sincere belief in some other religion or person is sincerely wrong. That's just... That's just the truth right there. So if you have friends and relatives and people who say that I, I love Jesus, but I don't do church, then you've got something to talk about. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and faith and truth. So 
we need to understand that it is his blessing and his kindness and his favor once again that brings us to this place where we can really have this unbridled trust in the truth of Jesus Christ's message in the kingdom. And yes, it is a gift of God. Now, people begin to complain and say that it isn't fair that only people with faith in Jesus get to be saved. Sorry, but life's not fair. Even in, in the non-faith world, life is not fair. It's not about being fair. It is about, are you willing to take the leap to really live that life for Christ? You know what? Every human being is born with a faith inside of their heart. So there really is no excuse. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Jesus put aside himself. He didn't need to. So that we can come into this complete life exchange. And we can really live out who he is in our lives. I mentioned the mirror. Very briefly in the exhortation. I'm not going to go into the whole history behind it, but there are these historic church brothers who they use the image of the mirror to emulate what sanctification is. Now basically what it means is that you are reflecting who Christ is in your spirit, in your soul, in your being, despite the fact that it is also reflecting what it is that we must work on in each season of our kingdom life. The hard part about mirrors, especially for us women, we have these magnifying mirrors, is that it magnifies the imperfections many times. What is your spiritual mirror reflecting tonight? Is it reflecting a heart that lives this faith and understands this gift so much that his life or her life is reflecting the author and perfecter of our faith? Or do we put it in a box whenever we don't feel like it? Another image that comes to mind that I received, we, we all received, those of us who went to the conferences, this is also an image of us drawing near to the Father, drawing near to Christ, wanting to be more and more like Him. Where is your heart? Where is your heart tonight? That's another question. Because as we realize it is not by works that we've entered the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's not how much money you've donated, although we should tithe. No matter how many hours we've spent in church. I know so many people who have volunteered and spent so many moments in church, and yet they're religious, but there is no relationship. They are dead inside. No number of good deeds, no number of prayers, you are no closer to heaven than the murderer on death row unless you have this change of mindset and the understanding of the kingdom life. Let's not be like the Pharisee and the tax collector, where the Pharisee said, Lord, look at me. I give to this place. Look at the way I pray. Look at the way that I am pious. I am holy. Wow. I, I, I. Let's be like that tax, co that tax collector who just said, Lord, thank you so much. I know I don't deserve it, but I want to live for you. That's basically the message. Now I'm going to get to where I want to get to today. We are his workmanship. Amen. We are his workmanship. The word for workmanship in the Greek word is poema, which means something that has been made. Mm -hmm. So the word can be used to refer to a work of art, as in the fact that where our English word poem comes from. Now, there have been many teachers and preachers who are eloquent about how this is we are God's poem, you know, we are God's workmanship. Now, I don't deny that God has crafted us wonderfully and carefully. In Psalm 139, 14, it says, I will give thanks to thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it great. But you know, there's a danger with this poem illustration because it uses a backwards definition. Let me explain the word poem. It comes from poema. It did not come from poem. And so we can accurately say that poems were given their name because they are something created. The same mistake is made at other times. For instance, the word for power in Greek is dudamis. It comes from the verb dudamai, which means to be able, to be strong. Now, where do we get, what word do we have that sounds like that? It's used in war. It's part of what makes fireworks pop. Dynamite. Dudamis, dynamite. In other words, to be able to be strong. It says in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Yes, the word means power, it means strength, and it means, it does not an ability, but not explosiveness. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what I'm saying is that yes, we are his workmanship, and God made us. It says he formed us in the womb, Jeremiah 1, 5, and caused us to grow physically and spiritually. Mm -hmm. We're products of God's personal attention. I like that part. We are products of God's personal attention. We are his handiwork. So why has he made us so carefully and wonderfully? Why were we made and what is the meaning of this life? Mm -hmm. So if we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, then let's see here. That should be our only purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Some people say, no, my purpose is to witness. But in fact, what did we say in our James study? Our good works are a witness. They show what our faith is like. And it opens up the opportunity for people to ask us about Jesus. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, Jesus. In heaven. So, so there are some people who say, no, the purpose of my life is to worship God. But again, good works are key to this as well. Worship is much more than just praise and worship when we're singing. It is the good things that we do and the sin that we try our best to avoid. Mm. That is our spiritual service of worship. If we remember correctly a few weeks back, what is holiness? Holiness is a lifestyle. Just because I'm your pastor does not mean that I'm 100% more holier than you. Because then that would make me holier than thou, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. It is just an extension of that holy life that I'm supposed to live, me being up here. So we need to, as Colossians 1.10 says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him. Wow. In all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So if we are not bearing fruit, right, then what we know is nothing. Some people get so hung up on the religiousness of doing good works, they begin to think that when we talk about the necessity of it, we're preaching a righteousness that comes from doing good. Then people, you know, then the other side will say, hey, that's not grace, that's works. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to Romans eleven six. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of grace. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So we need to continually remind ourselves that our good works don't save us, but they sure prove that we have grown and we have been molded and we are stronger in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, and the simple fact is that when we do them, we can't say, look at these great things I've done. The moment somebody says, look, I donated this kettle, this you know, box drum, or I donated, some people will say, I erected this, this monument in the church with my name on it. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. Nothing wrong with it, especially if you want to honor God through it. But don't boast about it. Mm. The best things that are done for the kingdom are quietly done. God has prepared the way for us beforehand. We can never take credit 
for all the things we do for the kingdom. Because Jesus says in Luke 17, 7 to 10, but which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's coming from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards you will eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? Mm -hmm. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we give our whole lives to serve this wonderful God that has brought us into this wonderful life. So we cannot be self-righteous or prideful. We are doing what we're supposed to do and we have been commanded to do. There is no way that I can get glory in doing good. It is for, for God's love and glory. It is what is expected in the kingdom. Remember that as we go through our daily lives, God puts opportunities for us to do good deeds. But God makes sure that we see someone who is in trouble and expects us to rescue them. God makes sure that the basket is passed in front of us and he expects us to give what he wants to be given to him. God makes sure that we see someone in need and expects us to once again be there for them. But these are all things that need to be done with the right heart. Remember, he looks at the heart. It's not the doing. It's not your checklist. I have helped somebody in need. I have given to this organization. Therefore, I deserve a favor from God. Please. If your heart's not in it, it's best not to do it. So I like to think of these good works that God has prepared for me beforehand as open doors. There are doors placed in front of me that I choose to walk through mm -hmm. because I know that God has placed them before me and expects me to walk through them. His job is to put the door in front of us so that we can trust him when we walk through it. Yes. How many times a day do we see a door and just keep driving? Mm -hmm. We turn our heads and keep walking because I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't want to get involved. I'm going to mind my own business. Saints, good works are our business. They are the proof that we have gotten serious in the kingdom. When we say that, oh, I just want to sit and listen to the music. I want to be passive. This is not a passive faith. This is a faith that is worth the risk. I read another article before I close of a kidnapped 16 year old in a African nation. They're about to execute her right now. They're about to execute her right now because good works are her business. The work of Christ, the promises that are 100% guaranteed were her business. They told her, you may live if you can recite the tenets of Islam. She said, no, I would rather die. Because when God prepares a good work for us to do, we should walk in it. Yes. It is the open door for us to show the light that we have in Christ. It is our witness. Mm. It is our act of worship. And it will help us to increase in not only our knowledge, but in our love and understanding of this God who took a risk for us. Yes. Again, we are his workmanship. I'm going to go back to the verse. Amen. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. We should walk in them. Wow. We should walk in them. I like that phrase. Are we walking in the fullness of God? Are we seeking the open doors, the open opportunities? Or are you unknowingly shutting those opportunities down for yourself? Hmm. Every moment that you say that I don't have the time, I don't want to take the effort, it's not my thing, you can hear that door slamming shut every single time. Hmm. 
And when it comes to witnessing and when it comes to entering the kingdom, you have lost another person that you love. I don't have the words to say. I'm not educated enough. I don't know doctrine. I don't know theology. I don't know philosophy. Neither did the thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. All he said was, Lord, take me with you. Okay, you'll be with me in paradise. Done. I'm drawn back to that pagan widow with the kid who had the, the ailment. And she even said, even the dogs get the crumbs. Mm -hmm. So we should want every bit. Those of us who are already part of this kingdom, we should want every bit. Every morsel that the Lord wants to feed us. Yes. So I want to ask you this question tonight. I'm going back to the mirror. A mirror can show something great and it can also show your flaws. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling anyone out because I feel like God is calling me out too. But let us take this time before we celebrate the Lord's Supper in silence and reflection to ask God in this season, since I am your workmanship and I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful in me, what is this work that you're beginning in me this season? What do you want me to reflect that others may ask, who is this Jesus that you love so much? Church, if we, as it says in Psalm 139, if we are fearfully and wonderfully made, then our souls, our spirits, our hearts, our mindsets should know it well. We should know our God. In this time of reflection, I would like to request that if you have, you can do it in your cell phones, in your notes, if you have a piece of paper and a pen, write down the people that you know, that know of God, that maybe don't care to know God, but you love them enough that you would like them to be a part of being fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me, Pastor, I don't know anyone who's lost. Because the loss doesn't necessarily mean the people outside of our family, outside of our work, outside of the people that we care about so much. If God brings some people to your mind, hand them over to him. I know that many of us have people in our lives that have been exposed to the gospel that have heard of this wonderful life in Christ. Yes. But maybe they just don't want to choose it because they were taught, as was mentioned in the teaching, we need to clean ourselves up before we come before the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. No. Come as you are. That's what we can tell these people. As we close in prayer tonight, I'm reminded of a story that was given by the general superintendent this morning, actually. They had been missionaries in Russia, and there's a palace there that has been restored. Yes. Now, our main verse was the rejoice in the Lord always. Again, and again we say rejoice but there's a portion in that scripture that if you can if you'd like to read it on your own time talks about restoration mm -hmm. and she gave this wonderful picture of going into this palace and hearing about the artwork that was on the wall and there's a total difference between a restoration mm -hmm. And basically copying it or reconstructing it. 
when you try to restore a piece of art, you want to bring it to its former glory. That's what you want to do. You want to bring it to what it, what it was when it was beautiful, when it was shiny, when it was made wonderfully. So as we pray tonight, Lord, restore to these people the joy of their salvation. Yes. Lord God, yes, we are saved, but the joy of our salvation sometimes dies. It dies with the challenges of life. It dies with the unexpected turns. Our lights dim when challenges come. But Lord, you tell us in your word that we should shine it. Let your light shine before men. Don't, there's that uh, Sunday school song, don't hide it under a bushel. In other words, don't cover it. Don't let it die down. Mm. Remember, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Place that image into your mind. And if that is so, once again, let's tie in together what we have been talking about in chapter one, about the need for us to really get serious. Yes. Yes, he is so, so wonderfully happy that you're all here tonight, that you're all sitting in these pews, that you're all here ready to learn. But he will be even more happy even more joyful and even more pleased with you if you take the time to converse with him. It was also said in the conference this weekend that prayer, well, I have to sum it up in what I saw in the slogan, prayer is the most important conversation you're ever going to have. Yes. More important than texting your parents, texting your loved ones, texting your friends, yes. going on social media. It is the first and only, and it is the deepest conversation yes. that you can have. Because it draws you towards something. Again, spiritual mirror shows two things. Not only does it show and magnify the things that we need to work on, but it magnifies and it emphasizes the joy that we find in the strength of Christ. Yes, thank you. Again, Lord, this is Resurrection Day. Mm -hmm. It's loosely termed in countries like Russia because it's in their calendar. But for us, it means that we serve a living Savior I serve a living Savior. He's in the world today, right? I know that He is with me, no matter what men may say. What is it again? He lives? He lives. He lives, right? He lives. I like the part at the end. He walks with me and talks with me. Yes. That's the ending question tonight. Does He walk with you? Yes. Do you take a walk with him? Not literally, but do you take a walk with him in your spirit? Do we all walk side by side with him enough that we trust him to make us every bit whole? Mm. Lord, as we transition into the celebration of the Lord's Supper, may we take it with joy yes, and with the understanding that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you. Now, Lord, I just commit all these people to you. May they not shut the doors unknowingly, shut the doors of opportunity to live this life. Father, there are opportunities waiting for each and every individual here tonight. Yes. Don't be afraid to reach for it, church. You don't have to get on a soapbox, grab the four spiritual laws, and say that he has a wonderful plan for your life. Yes, he does. We can tell that to all the people that we know. But the most important thing for us to do is to pray for you. So if you have written them down, if you reflected on them, starting this week, continually pray. 
or that. I'm just so amazed at the fact that there are pe like people in Russia who will stand for three hours to see a waxed, embalmed, dead body mm. of a dictator that. And yet many of them will not come into the light to see our risen savior who loves them so much. There are people that we know, and many times, even within our own spirits of seasons, Lord, where we put things above you. Hmm. Whatever it is, Lord, give us a day to unplug. Give us a moment to take a breath and to say, okay, Lord, how can I please you today? Lord, I just want to talk to you. I don't have any requests. I don't have a grocery list. I just want to praise you. If we start doing that little by little, the God of heaven will reveal to us all the things he has planned for us. God, in this moment right now, we stand in awe of you, God. I myself, Father, can only think about your love and your mercies that flow down from heaven. Do you really need Jesus tonight? Is he an afterthought? Father, I pray that it's not an afterthought. You are the central thought. And you are the most important conversation that we have. Yes. Yes, Lord. As we approach your throne of grace, as we approach your celebration table, prepare our hearts and our mindsets to receive the elements in a way that is right, that is pure, and that is just willing to receive all that you've given us in this season. Yes. And it is in your son's name. A righteous offering anoints the altar, and his fragrance rises before the Most High. The sacrifice of a righteous man is acceptable, and its remembrance shall not be forgotten. Glorify the Lord with your generosity, and do not reduce the first fruits of your hands. In every gift let your face be cheerful, and sanctify your ties with gladness. Give to the Most High as he has given to you, and give to him generosity according to your windfall. For the Lord is he who repays, and he will repay you sevenfold. If you have questions on how to send your tithes and offerings, please do not hesitate to ask during our deep dive into the Word session. We hope you were blessed by today's short worship time and message. Please stay tuned for our deep dive into the Word of God at 5 o'clock p.m. You may start logging into our Zoom session right now so that we can have a little fellowship and community time before our God bless you.